As we were in Houston this past week, uh, Pastor Josh and I were there, preached three times in New Caney, Texas, and Crosby, Texas, and started back home. We heard, we started receiving texts about what was going on in Boston. Immediately, my spirit uh, began to turn within me. And uh, we live in a day and age where it seems like every day is some kind of heightened news, some major news. So if you're not really careful, you kind of become numb to uh, what is going on in the world today because it seems like every day is so significant. Every day is historical. And if you're not really careful, you don't pay close attention. And uh, when I originally heard that something happened at the Boston Marathon, I kind of listened and then, you know, Josh and I were listening to music, talking about different things, and we just kept going. Then I kept receiving texts. And then we began to research it, you know, on the uh, internet ourselves and begin to see what was transpiring. And I really became nauseated, I'm sure, as you did as well, at this awful uh, attack with these Boston bombings. Uh, I began to think about this month in particular, historically, uh, especially in America. I mean, it just seems like April has been designated by the enemy just to bring great destruction uh, to our nation this month. And I started, uh, you know, we jotted down some of the things uh, that has happened. You know, Abraham Lincoln was shot April the 14th. Um, Hitler was born April the 20th. The Titanic sunk April the 15th. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated April the 4th. Um, the Waco burning um, with Koresh, David Koresh, was April the 19th, 1993. The Oklahoma City bombing, I'll never forget that, April the 19th, 1995. I was at the Azusa Conference in Tulsa, Oklahoma when, when that happened. Uh, the Columbine shooting was April the 20th, 1999. The Virginia Tech shooting, April the 16th, 2007. Uh, just last year, the BP oil disaster was April the 20th, 2010. 50 years ago this week, Martin Luther King Jr. penned a letter um, from a jail in Birmingham, Alabama, in which he wrote the words, and I find this to be very prophetic, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. As I began praying uh, about where we are, I really began to be challenged about some of the significance of the details that I saw transpire on Monday and the things I've seen transpire since then. Today was very prevalent. Today was very uh, significant in the transpiring of all of these events in that we saw something happen uh, between the president and the Congress today that really brought a side out of him that I've not seen before. And it is really a sign of how divided our nation really is. And I don't know about you all, but that really, really concerns me. As a matter of fact, I pinned something on my Facebook the other day that offended some people, and I didn't mean to. I simply stated that the nation I live in is not the, na the nation I grew up in. And I just talked about that this nation faces different challenges. It has different agendas and different directions. That didn't, I didn't mean anything offensive by that. It's just a fact. Uh, my generation, when I was young, we didn't face terrorism. We, we didn't have to deal with that. You know, the worst thing we had to deal with was gang fights in high schools and the KKK versus the Black Panthers, and that was about the jest of it, you know, other than we were having war outside, you know, the Vietnam War, all of that stuff. But, you know, this whole terrorist homeland attacks, we, didn't, we never heard the words homeland security. It's a new day. Uh, I said last week, and I'll tell you again, the day we live in, uh, when, when we were young, you had to, you know, push certain buttons to watch certain things. Now you have to push certain buttons to make sure you don't see certain things. And it's a, it's a new, violence is, is rampant. It's an it's, it's interesting time that we're living in. Um, and as I began to think about some of the events that transpired, I, I began to think about terrorism is a horrible thing. It is, a, it is a horrible thing. And I wrote this down. I told Pastor D when I walked in, I said, man, the Lord spoke to me all the way from the house to the church tonight. And as soon as I ran my office, I had to get the pen and write some of this stuff down. And here's what I heard. Terrorism is an attack on trust. Terrorism is an attack on trust. And then I heard this. Trust is the trellis 
on which relationships grow. Trust is the trellis on which relationships grow. If there's anything our nation lacks, it's trust. Trust and respect. We have lost trust and we have lost respect. We've lost trust in our government. We've lost trust in our churches. We've lost trust in our schools. We've lost trust in our families. And the child of the lack of trust is a child of disrespect. And if I see anything in this generation, in schools I go to, in places I attend with young people, there's no respect. There's no more yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. That's, that's unheard of. That's Chinese to this generation in America. You know, to say uh, Mr. or Miss, is, that's foreign to this generation. It is a strange time that we're living. I see it with pastors' children. They will just talk right back to them like they own their level. And it's, uh, you know, I wasn't raised that way, and I didn't raise my children that way. My dad was 70 years old, and I remember him walking in our house and telling my whole family, you know, we had five generations living at that time, a family full of about 60 people. And he started talking, trying to tell everybody something somebody else was talking. Man, he clapped his hands and said, hey, I'm talking right now. And, uh, you know, when my dad talked, E.F. Hutton listened. You know, because he demanded respect. He was the dad. You understand what I mean? And uh, somehow, so now we've justified that, that we say, okay, well, we can't afford to disrespect the excuses. We can afford to disrespect our dads because of the way our dads have lived their life. And that's, that's the challenge that we face. Um, so we, 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 there's an all-out attack on trust. Uh, I, I read this today. Ralph Waldo Emerson said this. All I have seen teaches me to trust the creator for all I have not seen. Isn't that true? Now, let me give you some facts about Monday that I found to be interesting, and we'll just talk. Is that all right? We talk tonight because I really feel like as a bishop of this house, I have a responsibility, and that's why I made the call today, Facebook tweeted everything else to get everybody here and i want to tell you thank you for coming i respect you very much for being here tonight and you won't regret it you'll leave here blessed um but monday was a very significant day not just because it's the boston marathon but the boston marathon marathon is held on patriots day now we we know about that but patriots day is really the celebration commemorating the first battles of the revolutionary war and isn't it interesting that we started this year and our theme was revolution, that we believe that God was about to bring a revolution to the earth. So here these attacks occur on Patriot's Day, Patriot's Day being the day that we commemorate and celebrate the first battles of the Revolutionary War. The Revolutionary War is very simple. It's the war that said we want independence. Now we want our freedom, right? And... Um, as I begin to research it, I, I, I find it to be very interesting that on this day, Patriots Day, they moved it to the third Monday of April now of every year. It used to be designated for April the 19th, but they moved it to a certain day, third Monday of every year, so everyone would know and they could run the Boston Marathon and all of, all of those things. But I find it very interesting that even today, uh, Pastor Norris in Lexington, they at 6 o'clock in the morning and 9 o'clock in the morning, they actually reenact um, the trail of Paul Revere. And uh, Paul Revere, of course, was the patriot that devised the strategy of using lanterns, light, to warn the Minutemen about the British invasion. And uh, I, I, thought that, I thought that was very interesting. Then as I began to study what a patriot is, a patriot is not only one that is dedicated and loyal with love to his particular country, but a pat the word patriot is der derived from where we get the word patriarch or father. It's very akin to the word lineage in the Greek. It has to do with loyalist or the synonym is loyalist or loyal to the lineage. It has to do with father. Now, I say all that to say that when this thing transpired, one of the first details that emerged from this horrible tragedy 
uh, was the name of the young man who was the first victim that transpired or the first death of this bomb. And he was an eight-year-old boy. And I won't say his name, but you all know who, who he is. But how it happened, it was when his father crossed the finish line. This boy ran out of the crowd, hugged his father. And his father was tired from the marathon, sending back to his mom and his sister to the crowd. And his, his father continued to walk in order to calm his heart rate down and catch his breath. And when the boy approached the mom and the daughter, the bomb went off and it killed the boy. The greatest symbol, I was thinking of this today, what greater picture of trust is a little boy hugging his father? When I think of an image of a little boy hugging his dad for finishing, everything about that picture says trust. Julius, my grandson, today, when he hugs me, I feel his trust in me. I watch him hug Justin, and I see the trust. He totally trusts his dad. I remember when Dustin was a little boy. When he, when he, it was a different hug. When he hugged me, it said, Dad, I just know you have me. Can I tell you, I really believe there's an all-out attack in this hour on trust. I really believe that. I really believe, because here's why. If you lose trust, and, and that's why I'm real threatened by whatever is going on, and I don't know all the details of it, that, that the government would think about taking off of our currency, in God we trust. I think that's a bad day, y'all. I need you to clap right there. That's a bad day. That's a bad day. And so, you know, I, I, I thought about that little boy, and I thought about that hug, and I thought about how that represents trust. And everyone trusted there that this would just be another Boston Marathon. It would just be another race. No one expected terrorism to strike. And I, I've learned since 2001 to despise the word terror. I don't like it in any shape, way, or form. And you shouldn't either. Are y'all hear what I'm telling you? Psalm 91 says this. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings shall you trust. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. You shall not be afraid for the terror you shall not be afraid. Watch the wording. For the terror by night. He didn't say it wouldn't come. But he said, I'm going to do something in you that when it does show up, and this is why I thank God for our nation. And I'm going to say it again. I bleed red, white, and blue. I'm going to make that clear. And we don't know if this is domestic terrorism or international terrorism, but it don't make me no difference. I thank God for my nation. I thank God for my country. I thank God for the United States of America. And if you don't like our country, go live in the country of your choice. But if you live here, love it here. Can you say amen to that? And I love my country. I love my country. Even when I don't agree with everything, I still love my nation. Amen. His truth will be your shield and your buckler. Terrorism is the unlawful use or threat of violence against persons 
or property to further a political or social objective. It's usually intended to intimidate or coerce government, individuals or groups. Or, now, this is the thing. Or to modify their behavior or their politics, but specifically their behavior. So the motive of terror is to get you to act different. The motive of terror is to get you to change your behavior patterns, to get you to be afraid all the time, not sure about being in big crowds, not sure about getting on buses, not sure about getting on planes, not sure about going to big events. That's the motive of terrorism. Let's bring that down to you personally. You don't war against flesh and blood. But you war against principalities and powers and rulers in the heavenly realms. You war against spiritual authorities. And let me tell you, the enemy loves nothing more than for you to live a life full of fear. To, for you to be captivated and captured in your present condition. Not trusting God to make your situation bigger and even better. He wants to keep you paralyzed in your condition and afraid to move forward. Can I tell you the enemy is a lie? Paul told his, his son Timothy, he said, God has not given you the spirit of fear, but he gave you the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. I need you to bump your neighbor and tell them I trust God. Amen. I trust God. Amen. So the purpose is to intimidate or coerce the civilian population to influence the policy of government by intimidation to affect the conduct of a mass of people or, or the conduct of government again. The official definition uh, says that terrorism is calculated. So terrorists generally know what they're doing. Their selection of a target is planned and rational. They know the effect they seek. Terrorist violence is neither spontaneous nor random, and that's the same way the enemy acts. Terrorism is intended to produce fear and destroy trust. By implication, that fear is engendered in someone other than the victim. In other words, terrorism is a psychological act conducted for its impact on an audience. So you know what I say? I'm, you know what? I don't want it to happen anywhere. But if it's going to happen anywhere, you know what? They mess with the wrong place. I do know this about Boston. Boston is a tough city. Everything you know about Boston says we tough. You know, I mean, all you got to do is think of Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> Boston's a tough place, man. And I can tell you the resilience of that city represents the elasticity of our nation that when we are stretched beyond measure, we have the ability to bounce back and say, bring it on. And I can tell you right now, Boston will come back. Boston will be strong. You know what, you know what stood out to me is the attitude of the Bostonian people. And how they, that, that they said they grieved the first day, but the second day they said now they're mad. And you know what? You can do with that what you want to, but that's how I feel too. I mourned the first day, but the second day I was mad. And I said, you know what? I, I just believe, God, that the people that are responsible for this are going to be caught very quickly and justice is going to come very, very fast. Can y'all say amen to that? Now, I'm not anointed to be a politician. I'm not called, you know, I don't, I'm not a politician in the pulpit. And, you know, my office is to preach. I'm not a news anchor. Thank God. And I'm not a politician. I'm a good news bearer. And I came to tell you the gospel tonight. That Jesus knows everything that's going on. Jesus loves you. He cares for you. He has everything under control. And let's learn to put our trust back in God. Can you say amen to that? Let's everybody clap our hands and give God praise tonight. Come on, everybody clap your hands. Let's give God praise. Amen. Trust God where you cannot trace God. Trust God where you cannot trace him. Do not try to penetrate the cloud he brings over you. Rather, look to the bow that is on it. The mystery is God's, 
but the promise is yours. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge. He is my fortress. He is my God. In him will I trust. A refuge is a shelter. It's a place to flee for safety. God is your refuge. I feel sorry for people that endure tragedies like this that do not know God. That's why I'm thankful for people that do know him. Because in times like this, we know, get to the house of God. Flee to him for safety. Flee to him for protection. Can you shout amen to that? He is my refuge and my fortress. It, it literally means he is my strong place. You cannot tell us we can take a hit like this and not be weakened. It takes the breath out of us. But guess what? We have a place where we can go to be re-strengthened by the Savior of our soul. We have a place we can go to receive courage and confidence from the God we serve. I prayed for you today, and I said, Lord, don't let fear enter in on my people. Lord, do not let mistrust invade the hearts of our people. Let them trust in you like never before. For a people that trust in God shall conquer, and they shall prevail, and they shall be restored, and they shall return to promise. How many of you believe that God is going to use this to strengthen our nation? Yes. Amen. He keeps us. If you can't believe he keeps your secrets, why do you believe he reveals his to you? Trust him. I trust him because I've told him all my secrets. And he ain't tell nobody. I told him every time I was afraid. And he didn't tell nobody. When you trust him with your secrets... He reveals his secrets to you. And let me tell you something. God has a wonderful plan for your life. And your best day is not behind you. Your best day is still in front of you. And it is time for us as a people of God to get on our knees and repent for this nation. Repent for the very thought that anybody would even consider taking off of our currency in God we trust. Repent for the mistakes that all of our fathers have made in this nation. Cry out to God. Repent for the entire nation. And I believe that God will turn in heaven and he will heal our land. I believe that there's going to be a great revival. I'm going to preach this till I die. I'm not going to preach doom and destruction and we're going to burn. I'm never going to preach it. I'm going to preach we're going to live and we're going to live an abundant life. We're going to live a quality life. We're going to live a life that we love and enjoy. Your children are blessed. Your children's children are blessed. You are the head and not the tail. That's what God says. That's what God says. Can you say amen to that? Touch your neighbor and tell him, I will trust him. Amen. I'll, I'll stop now. We just, we just pray. But I found one more scripture I thought I'd share with you. Isaiah 54 and verse 11. And this is what I feel for our nation right now. O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors and lay thy foundations with sapphires. And I will make your windows like gates and your gates of carbuncles and all your borders of pleasant stones. Listen to this. And all your children shall be taught of the Lord and great shall be the peace of your children. In righteousness shalt thou be established, thou shalt be far from oppression. For you shall not fear, and you shall be far from terror, for it shall not come near thee. I speak that to you in Jesus' name. I speak that to you in Jesus' name. I speak that to you in Jesus' name. The terror that has hit our nation is not going to change our behavior. I will be here Sunday preaching. You will be here Sunday praising. We will be here Sunday working for the kingdom. You will be here Sunday worshiping the king. We're not changing anything. All we're going to do now is preach harder, pray longer, and praise higher. Can you say amen to that? That's what we're going to do. Fathers, men, I challenge you. 
Look at it. Look at the history. Look at the attacks. Look at the demonic forces. It's all about lineage. It's all about patriots. It's all about patriarchs. It's about men. It's about men finishing. It's about men standing and saying, you're not going to have my children. You're not going to have my grandchildren. You're not going to have... You're not going to have our schools. Men have to stand up and say, I will be the patriarch in this generation. I will lead this generation in godly example. Can you say amen to that? Every man, please stand. <coughs> Would you lift your hands, brothers? Father, I pray for these men now that you will give them a backbone like a saw log. That you will give them a faith in you. That when the wives and the children, the women and the children around them look at them, they will see a stalwart man, a stable man, a man that does not flinch in the face of adversity, but a man that knows who he is and who his God is. Give us strong men in this generation, Father, not weak men. Lord, help us to stand up and be full of courage and lead this generation in the way it should go. I speak to the men of this house and the men watching me all across this nation tonight. Show yourself a man. Show yourself a man. Show yourself a man. Stand up in this storm and show this nation what men of God look like, what men of God act like. Take your mantle, take your position, and be a man of God in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I need you to turn around and hug two or three brothers and tell them we got this. Be a watchman. I want to do one more thing here. You men be seated, and I need the women to stand. Ladies, I want to speak to you. I said on New Year's Eve, based on what we saw in Newtown, Connecticut, and some of you will remember the prophecy, this would be a year that the enemy would attack specifically what? Two things, women and children. Because of what happened in Newtown, I started seeing this thing. The majority of the people injured in Boston, women and children. Who were the victims? Women and children. Who transpired? Two women, one child. Women, I'm telling you now, I implore you as your overseer of your soul, bishop of this church, commit yourself to God at a level you've never committed to him before. Be sure you under the covering be sure you're attached to a local church. Be sure you have a man of God that, or a woman of God that speaks into your life. But get in the local assembly and commit yourself like never, never before. Encourage your husband to be a man of God if you're married. If you're single, commit to God like you never have. If we lift your hands, please. I speak protection, Lord, over these women. I speak protection over these women now in the name of Jesus. An enemy, I tell you now, you will not have your way in these women. You will not harm these ladies. You will not affect these ladies. You will not detour these ladies. You will not destroy these ladies. I speak a praying woman in this house. I speak a woman of God up in this house. Ladies, begin to lift your voice, please, all over this church. Begin to pray right now. Begin to pray right now. God, have mercy on our children. God, have mercy on our spouses. God, have mercy on our families. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I pray that a revival break out through women who know how to pray. Lord, you birth things through women. You use women to birth things in the earth. I pray these women will birth the greatest revival this nation is seen and they birth it through prayer that they'll pray like they never prayed before 
I need somebody in here paying attention what the Spirit's doing right now. Father, in Jesus' name, let's all stand, lift our hands, and lift our voice, men and women, and begin to cry out to God all over this building. Come on, every hand raised. Go, oh God, raise up a great army. Raise up a great army, God. Raise up a great army. Raise up a great army. Protect the lineage. Protect the generation. Protect the generation, Lord. 